All right, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, this is a sp- another special episode of Guru Friday. Even though we're taping this on Guru Friday because I had to do a special project for my son last night that led me from <laughs> from my podcasting uh, details. But otherwise, we have we have a good a good topic today, and I'm joined by two co-hosts, uh, my boys Seth Mers and, and Robbie Fails, my staff. So um, we're going to jump right into it as soon as uh, Seth is going to give us the first question. All right, so question number one uh, comes from is it Dr. Details. Uh, came across a post on your social media account describing that it's okay to be accurate uh, when you're teaching students. Uh, in the post, you choose some examples of flexion extension, ulnar radial deviation, and pronation supination. Um, just referring back to one of Jason's posts, he posted uh, just a visual for uh, teachers to readily identify uh, and uh, name different types of body motions. Um, his question here, uh, it's a little long, but um, he said, I have had the same debate with other experienced coaches whom I enjoy having discussion with regarding their own teaching and coaching philosophy. They seem split on the necessary uh, of delivering accurate, they, excuse me, they, they seem split in the necessity of delivering accurate information at the cost of confusing the student. I've always chosen to be accurate and detailed, but of the difference of opinion during my debates on this subject, I've decided to try and be less concerned with being so accurate and trying to speak in my students' words. Um, Example here, he says, he's got a student at the top of their swing, uh, and I begin to move their wrists into flexion in the early transition, and the student describes this as twisting the wrists Mm -hmm. rather than correcting them or explaining other terms. I just went with their verbiage, and they continue to improve but but may not learn the actual terminology. A piece of the golf nerd inside me died, but I was happy that my student was happy with the results. Um, Is it possible to teach a student um, this information without having the ready knowledge, uh, the, excuse me, the detailed knowledge of the information and delivering it in simpler or less accurate way? Yeah, and I, I think it's a great question because, you know, it's it's a hot topic lately in, in the teaching circles. And there's, there's a lot of different directions we can go with this. But I think the first thing that, that came to mind is, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not out there using these anatomical terms with with students especially newer students 100 percent of the time doesn't mean that we don't want to be accurate and that's the, the big reason for my post was just to continue to challenge coaches to push towards the best information possible thanks seth i know you got to run Sorry, to, a to a lesson no no problem um but i think it, it's pushing it's pushing our industry forward uh, is is the most important thing, and I think. Thank you, uh, like David Orr and a couple of guys that sort of came to my my uh, my rescue there with my with my post, and then I appreciate all the the opposing views as well because I can see both sides in this situation. And a couple of couple of notes that I sort of took when I was preparing for this, that I think could be relevant, and just a just a great question for discussion, and we could spend an hour on this probably, and we may may just do that and and i'm coming from a middle age to older sector of the teaching game and then i've got robbie here that's brand new he's been teaching just a a couple of years so it'll be a good a good uh exercise uh, for him to to get his thoughts in here but i think what we've always done is making sure that our our information is accurate with the description of what we're trying to get with the student right so I would say that flexion and extension are probably the two most used that I, that I probably attach to different metaphors, which I think is, is the most important thing because obviously we've got to have the student understanding and then remembering what, uh, what we've taught them. So, you know, using, you know, wrist angle changes at the top uh, where if i have somebody flexing their lead wrist whether it's at the top of the swing or in early transition i will have them describe that to me like the like the uh, question stated 
And then I'll add some things like screw in the screwdriver clockwise or motorcycle like Tyler Farrell, I think, uh, coined that phrase. So I think they're going to remember that probably a lot more, but it doesn't mean that I can't use the proper language that matches that anatomical position, uh, which I think is important. It was funny this morning, my first lesson uh, at nine o'clock this morning uh, was a guy that I've had for a while and I was just sort of testing him to say, all right, let me, let me do an experiment. So he was in a pretty good position where he was making the, the proper shape in the downswing that I wanted, uh, but he just wasn't quite square in the face. So we're hitting a lot of pushes. And he goes, well, what do you think? And I said, what if I told you that I needed your lead wrist to flex more in early transition to square the face? I go, what would you do? And he showed me the perfect flexing the lead wrist <laughs> okay because he knew and we had discussed it right so mm -hmm. it didn't take me two seconds mm -hmm. the initial time that i that i uh gave him that information so when we were doing the diagnosis and this was several lessons ago i simply grabbed his lead wrist curled it and said this is what we call flexion that was it okay now I did give him some metaphors to attach that. And I said, it's kind of like screwing a screwdriver. So you're trying to give them some relevance, I think, of things that they would recognize feel-wise, right? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're trying to use the correct language, but then we're attaching it to a metaphor or a feel right. that could help them make the change quicker. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long. So I think it, it, when I did the post, all I'm saying is don't be afraid to push the limits of calling it what it is. Yeah. If not, then it could get misconstrued. And I, I was thinking, you're not going to call a club pass something different, right? I mean, we're not going to call the club face something different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, when we're describing track man numbers, we're not going to mm -hmm. give them in, inaccurate information, right? We're going to call it what it is. So the more we can sort of put that into our teaching, I think the better off we're going to be. Now, again, it, we're looking at you know, internal and external rotation of the shoulder. I mean, that stuff can be very confusing. I, I was confused by it <laughs> for, for several years before I kind of figured out, okay, this is what it needs to be to get it straight in my head. So I'm not using that very often, but I might throw that in there after I'm either demonstrating, which I think uh, is, is a really good way to communicate that to the student. I'll get in there and make a slow motion swing and show them. So now we're modeling, right? And that's an old school method, but still very, very effective. Um, and then moving them into positions that we want them to feel right. and then getting the feedback from the student. If they want to call it something else, that's great. But then I will always kind of spoon feed the correct language into it. Um, what do you think, Robbie? I, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, no, and certainly I can, um, I can um, definitely picture that having, have, after having seen you teach a lot. I mean, that's, that's not hard for me to, to, take the words that you're saying and kind of get a mental picture of exactly what you're talking about. Um, the one thing that I would add is that while there's no good reason to not use those correct anatomical terms, you don't want to rob the student's opportunity to relate it to something they already understand. 100%. So yeah. when I, like I, I'll give an example, like the other day, uh, there was a student that I was working on, um, on that exact motion that you're just talking about where you're flexing that lead wrist and I went up to okay well when we were looking at the video I said well he said the main thing that we're going to need here is we're going to need a little bit more flexion in that left wrist it doesn't need to get into flexion but it certainly needs to move toward it and so work um, I had him make a backswing and move the left wrist and I said okay we're going to start flexing this I said but how would you describe that flexion or how would you how can you remember that and uh, I, I think they said something actually um, what you just said earlier, I think they said, oh, it's just kind of like revving a motorcycle. I was like, yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I don't know if that particular player had ridden motorcycles before, but <laughs> he, uh, he was able to relate that in something that he understood. And um, whenever we kind of identify the feedback and say, okay, this is what the ball's gonna do when you do it right. This is what the ball's gonna do when you do it wrong. As soon as he started to see that feedback, he said, oh, I need a motorcycle more. I was like, yep, that's, that's exactly right. So I think just like you said, as long as they're, as long as, they're relating their own um, ways to what we described correctly, I think yes. you can't go wrong. Yeah, 100%. And I think the biggest thing, I think, that learning the anatomical 
correct language is done for the teaching business is it allows us to communicate teacher better teacher. as teachers and yeah. from teacher to teacher. And I think that's, that's huge, right? If we're talking on the phone, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, uh, that it becomes very, very easy for me and you to have a conversation yeah. without misconstruing whatever the right. heck we're trying to, to talk about. Right. So I think that's probably, you know, the biggest thing. Um, but, you know, again, going back to, to, to using metaphors, I know, uh, me and you heard the same study that talked about, you know, even the smartest people tend to remember metaphors quicker than they do uh, definitions, right. I guess, or, yeah. or language, um, yep. which is which is good. You got to you got to have a lot of tools to, mm -hmm. to kind of get people to change. And there's a lot of and that's what we talk about on this podcast right. a lot is, is getting people to change. And that's all. And, and results do matter. Result results are really what we're what we're after. Um, but I think the more repetition that you use, flexion, extension, you know, whatever, whatever you're trying to get across to the student, they will, they'll get it. Mm -hmm. People are, people are smart. And yeah. I will, I will uh, preface the, my first lesson was a doctor. So, uh. <laughs> so I mean, it didn't, didn't hurt, <laughs> but, but, still, but, but we've talked know. about it, you know, we've yeah. talked about it a lot and, and, uh, and I think that that definitely helped. But again, it's, it's communicating and it tests, it'll test your communication skills. And I think that's something that I'm pretty good at um, when I'm explaining it to somebody you know, I'll, I, I've used internal, external a lot in my mm -hmm. lessons. Not that I'm asking them to regurgitate that. I'm just right. going to call it what it is, yeah. <laughs> all right? And they're going to say, well, my elbows are closer together or my right elbow is behind there me or go. my right, you know, whatever. Yeah. So that, that, I think that's, that's the way, that's kind of the way it goes. Right. Um, but it is a good debate, and I appreciate, I appreciate, and I'm, I'm not one to, to throw out too many controversial posts on social <laughs> media because you just know I'm the, probably the least controversial person. I read person. that. I was like, okay, who is that and what have you done with Jason? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just like, had had enough. I think yeah. I think, uh, I think my, my friend Joe Mayo probably had just got, gotten gotten in my head too much there So because we, we talk about that a lot, and, and I, I definitely uh, agree uh, with that side of it. But, again, there's, there's both sides that uh, allow us to do what we do best, which is make the students better. So... Any other comments on that? Yeah, I think? Um, I, I will share a little story. Um, so when I was when I was getting instruction as a as a high schooler, my my coach t um, was working on hinge, right? So as, when he told me to hinge in the backswing, I did a movement that now we would call lead wrist radial deviation. Radial deviation, right? Yeah, um, I think we talked about this the other day in training. On the when I when I moved to my first internship. Um, I got a lesson with the director of instruction there and he asked me to hinge my wrist. And when I did it, he was like, well, he's like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, that's not hinge. And he's like, this is hinge. And he showed me trail wrist extension. Right. Um, and so I was like, oh, I can't believe I had hinge wrong. But in reality, I didn't because hinge is just a made up term. There's right. nothing, there's no anatomical connection between the word hinge and any sort of motion of the wrist. Right. So if all these terms are made up anyway, then why not? express to the student what the terms yeah. actually are correct yeah. and john, john dunnigan yeah. the, the, i think uh commented and said if yeah. they don't know what it is and why don't we just call right. it the right thing yeah. so yeah and I, that's what we were talking about mm -hmm. in training the other day was and i think i mentioned that if you're hinging mm -hmm. there's three different ways to hinge right sure. you can hinge with you know lead wrist in, in, uh, bent cupped yeah. as we you know right <laughs> extension right yeah. so um which is typically not a good thing uh, right. so showing them how to do that and then calling it what it is i think is huge uh, that's a great example of of how it can be harmful if yeah. you're not misinformation yeah terms yeah so you start getting the, the face open and so let's go to, to question number two we're going to skip that that other thing but I think this is from yeah. our, our good friend, Curious George, <laughs> once again, striking the, yeah, so, talking about bunker shots. So, so George was out in the bunker the other day, and he was experimenting with different uh, sides of the wedge to contact the sand. Um, so the question reads, what side, heel or toe of the wedge, do you want to strike the sand with in agreed side bunker shots? Um, understanding that for typical short game, you know, stock short game shots where trying to kind of avoid striking the ground with the heel side yeah um so i was just wondering if that carried over to bunkers as well yeah i think it's it that's a good question because I, I don't think i've ever really thought about that um but thinking through it logically i would say you know the surface is different obviously sand is going to be soft where the club's going to cut through it so i don't think it has a huge effect um 
and that's why i mean if you just think about how we teach bunkers mm -hmm. we would never teach somebody to have high a high handle, handle position yep. at that imp or at address um to avoid dragging the heel so i, I don't think it has as big of effect it's, it, it's kind of like what i you know what i always think about and still would love to get uh, track man in the bunker is mm -hmm. I don't think the face has as big of influence in the bunker mm -hmm. it would start direction as the as the path does I sure. think it's probably closer to 50 50 or, or I mean, I, yeah towards the path yeah it could be yeah because yeah. because the ball goes ten tendency to goes <clears throat> towards the towards the direction we throw the sand right, right. um so yeah, and you know we teach bunkers. We want the handle low. If you kind of think of great bunker players back in the day, like mm -hmm. Sevy and you know Gary Player and some of these guys, you know the handle's pretty low um, throughout. So I, I think I don't think that's really going to have a big, big effect on on anything really. And uh, just um, on the on the strike point. So imagining that if you were to hit a perfect bunker shot but the sand between the club and the ball disappeared, where would you want the strike location on that wedge? Strike locate, like on the Horizon face? Horizontal face look, yeah, so um, heel or toe. Hmm. I would say, I would say closer to the middle because I'm, I would want as much, as much of the mass of the club to be behind the ball, the, the center of gravity behind the ball. You're saying if there's no sand, right? So because um, I was saying if you want the most sand to be thrown, you'd obviously want the most mass of the of the face yeah. to be present. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting because we talk a lot about you know low point depth mm -hmm. um, and then low point front and back in the bunker. Sure. Um, I had a guy the other day that was his low point was back. And it was shallow, too shallow. Mm -hmm. And he was wondering, you know, why am I blading it or why am I, you know. So we, we had to talk about moving low point forward and also moving low point down some. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 a blend, I think, mm -hmm. of kind of how you're using the club through the bunker. But um, I still think in, in bunkers, entry point is the king. Mm -hmm. I really, really believe that because I just see most average golfers struggle from the bunker because they hit too far behind it and don't Impressive. realize it. Right. Don't don't even know. Right. Mm -hmm. Until you to you draw a line or show them, you know, what their divots and, look like and, and where the they start. The other thing is I would add is that they've they've intuitively found that they have to adjust the arc height to match that because when the low point gets too far back, if they if the low point is too low, obviously you're gonna be taking up a ton of sand. So I mean, I, I don't know if you found this as well, but here recently, and, it, and it's one of these things, like you, you, you kind of go on stretches where you kind of see the th same things in, almost sure. in a string. But yep. um, lately I've been getting people's low point lower in the sand because once yeah. I move it forward, they're not, they're not getting enough, they're not taking, uh, the divot isn't deep enough. Right. They kind of yeah. learn, okay, all right, if, if my injury point can be here, then I can go ahead and I can take significantly more sand than I, um, so, so George was also hoping that you could reiterate some, some good practices for, for clinics. Certainly when you have four or five out there for an hour, you don't have that much time per student to really get to, you get kind of in the back of your head, you got the feeling that the next person's kind of waiting for you to move on. Um, and for those coaches that t tend to get a little bit um, anxious in front of the student because they're, they think they have to get it right. Mm -hmm. right away <laughs> yeah um so what are what are some what are some ideas you have so you're talking there? more like towards like a beginner clinic yeah. or mm -hmm. like what you had the mm -hmm. other day with the with the ladies yeah yeah i think you know and that's something that i was very fortunate to um to get a lot of training in groups when i was mm -hmm. at the dana raider golf school which is you know we did we did huge groups and so we were dana did a great job of training us to to really manage a group. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's more, it's more group management than mm -hmm. it is the information that you're given a lot of times. Um, so we would have up to six to eight people sometimes. Wow. And, and, you know, and you, and you got to sit and I would always do the math at the beginning of the hour. Like, okay, I've got three, four minutes with this wow. person tops. Right. <laughs> so you got to th think of that sort of have a mm -hmm. shot clock in your head. Mm -hmm. So let's say, what do you, would you have four or five mm -hmm. the other day? Yeah. So if you got four or five, uh, students, the thing that I think is really important is once, you know, it, the, the brevity of the intro is huge. Like you got to, you know, give them, give them the plan mm -hmm. and then get them motivated quickly. Yep. And then the second thing would be to 
and this is where the experience comes in is, you know, you watch it. You only got about two shots you can watch. You can't sit there and watch them hit 12 shots like a normal private mm-hmm. lesson. And, you know, you can't yeah. let that much time go by. Mm-hmm. So you get a quick, okay, what's, what's the main goal here? And then you got to give them something to start with and then move on, right? So basically if it's maybe it's changing their grip a little bit or a posture change or whatever, whatever it is, or it could be anything, give them, give them that information, mm-hmm. watch them hit one shot and then move on. Okay. Yep. Reg- regard- the problem is, is that they may not hit it perfect and mm-hmm. you're going to want to stick there with them and you can't yep. do that. You got to keep moving. Mm-hmm. So then just be nice and say, Hey, okay, I'm going to go check on the next person. Right. Hey, they're, that's good. I'm good. Yep. Long- don't be afraid to give them this information and walk away mm-hmm. and get to the next person. So within the first 10 minutes, everybody in the group should have something to work on. Mm. Right. Yep. So uh, they're, they're all, they're all engaged in something. Right. I don't care if it's like, you know, some moving their left foot change or something it doesn't yeah, matter yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. hitting the ground or what mm-hmm. i mean i don't care did they have to have something so that's the first thing so that gets them moving because mm-hmm. there's nothing worse than you because what you're going to always do as a young coach is you're going to gravitate towards the worst person you're going to stay there for about 20 minutes exactly okay <laughs> and right. where the other four are like looking out looking over their shoulders yeah. going when's he going to tell me something that's right and then you're going to like not feel good about leaving so it's you've got to get you got to be able to <laughs> stick and move mm-hmm. man you got to get in there and then move keep moving and that way then you can kind of stand back and then yeah. let them fail for a little bit or let them succeed and and, mm-hmm. and evaluate and then you sort of just you're troubleshooting then yeah okay because they're somebody you're always going to have one person in the group go hey coach come here you know they're going to be mm-hmm. that that needy person that wants to right. get, grab you and, and and hog all of your time you got to like you know it's it's a time management thing but the other thing that i'll say that you've you've taught me that's that's been a big help as i continue to do these clinics is to constantly be watching the other players as you're standing in front of a certain student so yes. that if they're if, if they happen to do what you're asking them to do you can give them that feedback to say hey great job you did it that time 100 percent. that's that's a good point because that was the big thing that I, managing a big group is you got to have kind of have your head on a swivel <laughs> and and knowing their names is, is key too like yeah. in the first 10 minutes i always try to memorize everybody's name so that if you're working with joe in the end and then george hits mm-hmm. a good shot on the end you're like great job george that looked yeah. awesome so then they know you're watching them, mm-hmm. even though you're not actually working with them. Yeah. And that makes the student feel, feel important. And so, so it's good. So we're going to go outside golf just for a second. Cause that, yeah. that brings up a question for me. Cause I know how much you've, you've read on, you know, personal development and, and dealing with people is that, do you have any like tricks of the trade for learning names? Oh, wow. Um, God, I, I mean, uh, the good Lord blessed me with a photographic memory. So, I mean, ah, that's, that's like, right. yeah, that's, 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 <laughs> that's sort of, but it's again, it, it, it sometimes it makes you lazy because I mm-hmm. sort of, you know, rely on that a lot. But from things that I've read, because, you know, I read a book on it at some point in my career, is looking at sort of facial features where you can attach, you know, there's square headed Joe or something. I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> anything that you can sort of yeah. attach a visual to a name oh, great, yeah. is, is, is important. And then also, um, when I meet somebody is I'll have them repeat their name back to me. So that way I know, like it, I get it twice. So, so how you, how so you doing? Right? Example of that? So, so if I, if I meet you for the first time yeah. and say, hi, I'm Jason Sutton, you say, Hey, Robbie fails. And I'll say, is that fails Rob, Robbie fails oh, you know okay. so I get yeah. it and say you know yeah gotcha. yeah because I I still get lazy mm-hmm. sometimes and I'll forget and two minutes later into the lesson if I got a first time student like mm-hmm. oh crap I forgot his name yep. that's not a good place to be mm-hmm. so I'm always or I'll say spell your last name for me because you get mm-hmm. some you know, sure. some interesting yeah, last some, names yeah. where yeah you you don't know how to how to pronounce it and I said just spell your last name so it because I'm very I'm super visual so mm-hmm. if I that's why when I was in school I always had to write stuff down so I was basically getting it twice into my monkey brain that mm-hmm. that that's what i need to remember so if you can get them to to spell it for you say it again or even something where you can attach something that's maybe you've heard them talk about whether it's their job or whatever that can that can kind of jog your memory as well but yeah I, it's weird because I, I remember golf swings before i remember names yeah. a lot of times like i'll have students come back to me after a couple of year hiatus and <laughs> and as soon as i met they make a first swing i'm like oh yeah oh, i remember exactly what, what i did was. with you yeah. and then, so they're always really you yeah. know like i can't believe you remember that i'm like yeah but what's your name <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes you sometimes but i remember golf swings yeah. again just because i'm so visual i remember your ball flight but i don't yeah, yeah i remember what we worked on and yeah so uh, 
Yeah, but again, a lot of times you can don't be afraid to ask them a couple times. Yeah. Hey, so now I'll go through the group a lot of times. Like, okay, you're Joe, Mary, George, mm-hmm. you know, and that I just want to get, and they appreciate that because they know you're trying to really uh, remember sure. remember their names. Um, so, um, so I was going to kind of catch everybody up with you know if everybody listened to the podcast that we did with our training session last week, mm-hmm. which I thought was, was super fun. Uh, I gave you guys some homework, and we had a, we had a uh, fun discussion. And yes. then, since you already gave the secret away on Instagram, <laughs> okay, and I, I, like I said, he's like, you taught me to give information yeah, away secrets. for free, <laughs> but I thought we might hold on to this one for a little <laughs> bit longer. But and I'm sure there's there's tons of coaches out there that have, that have discovered yeah. uh, what we discovered. But it's always fun to kind of look at you know PJ Tour stats and mm-hmm. and even at the you know at the highest level. Uh, what those guys are doing and then Mm -hmm. you know the bottom of the spectrum or or in this case we were looking at drivers Uh, so I told you guys to you figure out why the uh, the best drivers in the game were doing what they were doing and was there Mm -hmm. some commonalities and then uh, the lower uh, we did total driving right so I said you know the guys that hit it the farthest and the Mm -hmm. straightest and so the total driving so we looked at quite a few swings right we so did. we, we kind of looked at I'm trying to think of the ones I know we went we dug into the lower uh mm-hmm. the lower echelon which uh Phil Mickelson was one of them who was Luke uh, Donald Luke was the Donald one, was right, the, one that, the big one that yep. you that you looked at so um what we noticed was and then you can kind of piggyback on is and it's something that that I had talked about and sort of conver- confirmed what I had been seeing just on video, and again, this was and when we did get some confirmation from a, a very reputable 3D uh, <laughs> very reputable. guy, yeah. right? And yeah. So we got we got that <laughs> approval, and we can share his name in a minute. But I I always saw a correlation of handle height at let's say you know for you swing geeks out there at uh, P5, right? So where the you know last parallel, uh, where six. the hand P6 with the last parallel. Um, where the hands were low and relatively close to the body. Okay, so the hands weren't out, the shaft wasn't very vertical, um, and then we saw obviously when the club flipped upside down at impact, the handle was still relatively low-ish compared to a lot of players that we saw that were driving poorly. Right. And I looked even as far back as Calvin Pete, Greg Norman, oh, you know, yeah. some of these guys that really were known mm-hmm. as great drivers of the golf ball. So then we discovered that just looking at the videos that we did from the guys that were low on the stats on total driving to uh, the best was there was a direct correlation of the timing that the trail arm straightened in the downswing, right? So the better drivers had a more bent right arm for longer okay now obviously there's a lot of factors that contribute to that whether mm-hmm. it's the club face position or um you know more forward bend more side bend more right side bend more rotation all the stuff that we we appreciate in good golf swings mm-hmm. and then the poorer drivers like luke donald was almost dead straight with his arms yeah, and he, impact he and, right he and phil were just a fraction away from being you know at maximum extension that yes, right, yes. right elbow. Yeah, which we know creates a very high rate of closure for the face, right? Or they because they probably had to, right? So again, all those the components of maybe having playing with a, a bit more of an open face or um, a bit more of a more vertical downswing. Mm-hmm. I mean, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, because um, really the, the the big things that is 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 going to be uh, required in order to get that kind of later arm extension are going to be really two things. So what is the club face doing in transition and, and what's the center mass doing relative to, I'm going to throw out a term here, but net force vector of the hand path, hand path right? Um, in that early downswing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been one measured player in it and I don't, I don't know if I can say this, but um, there's been one measured player who does not get the center mass below the net force vector in early downswing. Um, and he was definitely one of the ones that we saw that was super early on the, uh, on the trail arm extending uh, spectrum. Because when you think about what that trail arm is, is extending, what that's doing, um, it's basically closing the face um, relative to the plane. So right. if, you, if you can think of um, the, the two ways you can square the face would be to 
basically twist the shaft about itself. Yeah, which then, is what we enjoy and, and we then, teach. And then kind of closing by swinging the club in the plane of the swing. No, no closing of the about the shaft, but just swinging back and forth. Yeah. What that right arm extending is doing is that is really getting the club to pass the hands much, much sooner. Yeah. And it's also um, increasing the radius of the, of the swing, yes, right? So, right. It's moved, so, so now we're affecting sweet spot control. Yep. We're changing the sweet spot more on a right. horizontal yes. position. And then, so that's that's the face part of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as the the, the shaft shallowing, if, if you're going to shallow the shaft and you get the shaft flatter coming in, you need more rotation to complement that in order to avoid more body rotation yeah right yeah more, yeah, more, more torso more pivot yep yeah to in order to complement and prevent more of a heel bias pattern so yes um and what that also does is that as you curve the hand path what that's going to do is that's actually going to help the the face to square um passively by using that passive torque yeah um so if you have those two things in an early downswing if you're closing the face by twisting the shaft and you're getting the club uh, the center mass below the net force vector of the hand path, then you can really use more of a body centered, um, a body driven type of motion much, much later and through impact. Yeah. Now, if the body's driving, then what aren't the arms doing? The arms aren't firing. So when you, when you look at what you were looking at at P6, where yeah. the hand's relative, if that right arm is, is extending, where is that moving the hands? It's moving it out. It's moving the hands the ball. more out. Yeah, for right? sure. Um, yeah, which again, it, it could be coupled by what we call early extension, sure. you know, a chicken or the mm -hmm. egg. Who know, I mean, I know there's a lot of debate going on out there. Is yep. the club causing it to er, causing yep. the player to early extend or are they early extend and causing the player sure. to move the club out? Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a whole it, who, it's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's but, a lot of stuff going on there. But definitely those those two things are going to allow you to have that later arm arm extending now. Obviously, you have to have the body components to be able to, to, to complement that, which the other thing that we saw is that for, the, for those later arm extenders, you typically would see um, the torso be a little bit closer to the ground and also yes. a little bit further away from the target at impact yep. uh, relative so to where So they back up a little more to mm -hmm. probably what we, did, what we figured. And this is pure speculation. This is mm -hmm. 2D science here, right? right? <laughs> is that was more to control dynamic loft. Yeah. Right? Because if yeah. they, like, say Luke Donald, well, we talk, I think it was Luke Donald we were talking about how he kind of, his upper yeah. center moves a little bit forward, uh -huh. okay, but right. he can get away with it because he delivers the club with more loft That's because right. of that different type of release pattern. And you wonder why Luke Donald has been one of the best iron short game players. Yeah, probably really good for, for pitching, right? Yep. It's a lot of rotation, a lot of, a lot of forearm and hand action there. Right. I mean, probably decent for, for pitching, and obviously he, he can, he's a great around the greens. and. Yep. And we're talking, you know, we all, we all would love to have Luke Donald's game. It's yeah. not like we're bashing, <laughs> no. bashing it. But He's number one in the world at one point, right? right? Despite so. being what I think everyone would consider to be let subpar driving, yes. total driving. Yeah. Um, and and there, were, there were some incredible pictures. I think um, uh, Radar Golf Pro, <laughs> Jeff Smith, <laughs> just posted a picture of Patrick Rogers on, on Instagram. If you go and watch that, you can see how, just how bent that right arm is at impact. Yeah. how open he is with his pivot, how much side bend he has, yeah. and his inclination to the ground, and then how late that arm extends through impact yeah. is really, really beautiful to see. Yeah, um, and, but it, it shows you how important, you know, what we're working on with most of our players, which is not touring pros, is mm -hmm. a, a manageable club face, yep. a wrist angle at the top, a shallowing shaft early transition, because without that, the rest of it, goes to goes to heck yeah, right can't so do can't do it right mm -hmm. so so we're always looking at oh it's great it'd be great to get our chest open like that well it doesn't work if the hands right. are, are tipping out and the club head you know the center of mass is outside the yeah. hand path you know four and a half like mm -hmm. a lot of the guys we see yeah. we're, we're in big trouble right. now we're wiping we're hitting wipey cuts mm -hmm. with the morning newspaper you know so it's and the one of the ways that uh, we described it the other day was giving face closers early so you can have face openers late there you the go openers being side bend and rotation yep 100 percent. which you know i think makes for a more stable club face so then you know you you beat me to the you know I, when we start looking at some of this stuff you know again going back to trying to have the most accurate information mm -hmm. as we're imparting uh this stuff to our students and then also continuing our learning 
um, we always want to have uh, backup from 3D and what's actually happening. So you reached yeah. out to our smart friend guys. John Sinclair. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just a dumb redneck that surrounds himself <laughs> with a bunch of really smart people like John Sinclair, which has tested more tour players out there than probably anybody on the planet. And he confirmed that yep. there's a de- direct correlation yep. with what we're talking about. Yep. So you heard it here first. <laughs> I mean, again, it's mm-hmm. it, take it with, with whatever you believe needs to happen, but it's kind of cool to do these little mini research projects of, right and, you know. and and i mean i just when i obviously i was hoping that he would confirm but um <laughs> yeah, still there's there's a little leap of faith to even ask because you're you know obviously you're you know, i mean you don't want to be wrong but yeah you to to and and if if he would have said that i was wrong then you know that's that's great you know yeah <laughs> At least, no it's fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we would move on and yeah. try to figure out yeah so it's right. it's like and I, I love you know john graham and uh, Chris Como mm-hmm. and these guys that are these, you know, critical thinking guys that, that I'd love to surround myself mm-hmm. with, um, try to do that. They try to argue both sides, yeah. you know, and I think that's an important exercise for, for all coaches out there to stay curious and, you know, try to try to get as much information as you can. And mm-hmm. then again, our job is to be able to convey that to a student. Yeah. But I think that I've really, and you, you know, you've seen me teach a lot. Mm-hmm. I've really focused a tremendous amount of my energy on this trail arm yeah uh trying to just figure out how it's supposed to work yeah because i just see so many shankers for the oh average gosh, players yeah. and you know and and all this stuff sweet spot mm-hmm. control and hitting hitting driver shots in the heel mm-hmm. you know where gear effect just destroys some some people and they don't understand because they don't they don't understand where they're hitting the ball right and then why yep okay so that's i mean i think it's important all right cool yeah. so little nugget for you uh going out but Mm -hmm. you know again thanks for supporting the podcast uh thank thank you robbie for for being my co-host and and seth (laughs) yeah and i I hated seth had to leave early he had some good he had some good information he was going to impart but um we got started a little bit later and so we i know we both got to get back to the lesson t but guys i appreciate the support Uh, if you want your question answered on the podcast uh, don't be afraid to reach out i know some people have you know, DM me through Instagram or, or, or Twitter, and I'm at Golf Guru TV. Uh, Robbie's at Rob Fails Golf. But you can email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com, and I will try to get to your, to your questions. We've got some uh, really fantastic guests uh, coming your way here in the next few weeks, trying to nail down the interview times. Um, and I want to thank uh, Tom Stickney again this past week for doing that interview. That was that was fantastic because he's he's got so much. He's one of the smartest guys with probably one of the highest EQs that mm-hmm. I've ever met in the golf business, which I think is important. So I really appreciate Tom uh, sharing his uh, his knowledge. So until next time, what do we always say? Study, practice, teach, and pass it on. Pass it on, out of boy. <laughs> All right, thank you.